The Forest Service was started as a result of the Fulton Commission, which was held about 1910. It, by the way, recommended the Forest Service along military lines. The Forest Service started in 1912, and I would say probably 50% of its members enlisted in the First War. So it had a little of a setback. It was formed into about 10 districts under the head office in Victoria, and each district was in ranger districts. As a result of the commission, and primarily Granger, who was its secretary, and is considered the father of the Forest Service. In 1914, it was started, and at that time, H.R. McMillan, who was an agricultural graduate who'd taken forestry at Yale, and had some previous experience in cruising in connection with what later became the Paul River Company. He was its first chief forester. Well, I can't actually say what the mandate was, but it came out to the fact, one, protection, which was always given a high priority, and the orderly liquidation of a, a virgin forest. But we always knew that we would have to, to start with second growth, and we did start planning that. We went on the principle that we could depend on uh, natural regeneration for approximately half the logging. We also knew that we had to know what resources had, so we started what eventually became the inventory division. That was started in, the, in a very embryonic way, even before the first war, because they had uh, foresters go with exploration parties and report on forests. By the mid-twenties, that had gone into a much more formal thing, in which we were taking areas of land, making them into forests, and systematically surveying them by a rather poor statistical method. Uh, we ran lines roughly a mile apart across the contours and, and took samples. It was fairly crude, but it, was, it gave a fairly good opinion. Around about 28, 29, we started the first nursery. The first really big nursery was at Green Timbers. First main planting that I remember anyway on Thurlow Island in 1932. There was a previous one in uh, Campbell River. In 32, I was on it actually. And by the way, the meal costs at that time were 23 cents a meal, so you can see the times have changed. Matter of fact, in 1921, on my first uh, job in the Forest Service, the court was chief of the cruise party on the Nash River and uh, he had one, one experience there which was rather amusing. He was looking for corner posts which is right beside the, the river at the river and we, we did the work on the river by boat. He uh, went to look for this corner post <laughs> to get a tie in and when he came to the post there was a bear sitting beside it. <laughs> he didn't get the, the information that day, <laughs> he got back to the boat. Before 1930, they had started to use power saws, not so much for cutting standing trees down, but for cutting fallen trees into logs the right length. Don't think I ever remember chainsaws till after the war, but maybe they started before that. It was mostly hand cutting. And you know, in the old stumps out in the bush, you see those notches where the men put um, planks in to stand on so they get up above the butt swell of the tree. And the saws would be nine or ten feet long. Oh, I don't so they put the undercut and then chop out the notch with axes, and then go around to the back of the tree and saw from there and it maybe put a wedge in and pretty soon the tree would start to go the direction they wanted to. I, I don't remember any chainsaws in the pre-1930 years. They might have started to come in later. It was all animal power or muscular power in those first days. Then came the steam donkeys which were just a steam engine with a huge winch and steel cables. 
and hooks, you know, and uh, they would, and they had all kinds of very, the skyline, they often would haul the logs, they'd be right up in the air coming, and then dropped at the central point, and then loaded onto sometimes trains. They started using railroads, you see, in the logging in those early days, too. There were a lot of railroad operations up Vancouver Island, all the way up wherever there was merchantable timber. And of course, the, the fuel for the steam was a man bucking any kind of fuel locally, wood that would go into the firebox. Uh, they were starting to use caterpillar tractor type uh, traction to haul logs down to the stockpiles to be hauled out to the mills on the logging roads. It just happened that I began to pioneer this use of aerial photography, air photos, and it grew and grew. In 1936, there was high level interest in some lo a logged off acreage up island near Nanaimo, maybe four or five hundred square miles. So my boss, Fred Mulholland, came to me and said, Jerry, are there any air photos of this track? We could get the answers. There weren't any. Okay. So I said to him, I said, well, you know, Mr. Mulholland, if we could rent a little airplane and round up a camera somewhere, well, we, we could photograph it. So we just did that. We got a little float plane from a company in Vancouver and we scrounged an old War I camera that somebody had somewhere. The old camera didn't work too well, but and the pictures were horrible, but they gave us the answer. And that was the beginning of provincial air photo flying in British Columbia. Jerry pioneered in the use of air photos in um, survey work and by the end of the 30s we were taking photographs all over the place. After the war, when Jerry came back, that was taken over by the Lands Branch who formed a Air Surveys Division in which um, Mr. Andrews, Lieutenant Colonel Andrews was in charge. And from there on, I don't think we ever did any survey where we didn't have preliminary air photos which showed you the types, where they were part of else. My name is Jack Long and I was born in Vancouver in the year 1912, the same year that the Forest Service was started in British Columbia. Whether or not there's any connection, I really don't know. I was uh, hired under a, a youth program, it was called the Young Man's Forestry Training Program, uh, in which they, uh, they took uh, young fellows from about 16 to early 20s actually and gave them work in the forest. Many of them had never really held down a job in their lives before and uh, didn't know anything about swinging an axe or using a saw or even uh, a shovel. <laughs> it's a, a wonderful experience for young fellows. I was on the job at the Elk Falls Park in the winter of 37 and 38 where we planted some trees. Uh, the big fire of 1938 burned those 50,000 trees that we planted that winter. And uh, after that fire, it was realized that green timbers, which was the only nursery at that time, would uh, not be able to supply enough trees to plant these some 60,000 acres. And it was decided to put in a nursery at Campbell River which would be adjacent to the fire, which, you know, was in itself uh, quite an important factor. And we moved up to uh, Campbell River in the spring of 1940 and put in the first seed beds at that time. Uh, I might say that, too, that during the war that we used uh, some of the uh, conscientious objectors, the alternate service workers, they were called, fellows that didn't wish to go into the army and they did alternate work. And we had those in camps 
Um, and uh, it's kind of an interesting story in that all the fellows I had were Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, they were a bit of a nuisance in the camps because they wouldn't work on Saturday, and uh, but would work on Sunday. And so they put them all uh, with me at the nursery there. So I ended up <laughs> uh, working on Sunday and uh, listening to hymns on Saturday. <laughs> But they were a very fine bunch of fellows, I will say, and they did a lot of good work for us. Uh, during those Depression years, the, uh, uh, in the early uh, stages, there was uh, tremendous cutbacks. In fact, uh, in some years, they didn't even uh, fight forest fires. And uh, uh, a lot of people think that we came out of the Depression because of the Second World War, but I think we really started out of it when the decision was made to start programs such as the YFDP. First uh, job was in 1938 on the Youth Forestry Training Program. This was at the uh, tail end of the Depression. About this time, the decision was made to put people to work, and so uh, they started the forestry program with a dollar a day and your your expenses and that got me started in forestry the backbone of the forest service those years was the forest ranger for quite a while if you were a ranger in vancouver you stayed in a vancouver ranger you didn't go to other districts we changed that later. And one of the big changes to that, actually, was the ranger school. Some of our old-time rangers were excellent rangers, but they learned it on the job. They were good bushmen, possibly better than some of the ranger school graduates. And they were good firefighters. But one of the finest uh, men I knew as a field man was one of the rottenest note-makers uh, note I ever met. You couldn't understand his reports, but he knew his job. And the ranger school changed that. And it also had the effect that rangers did have a son. Well, um, I suppose you'd call it a, a den mother, the ranger school. They knew rangers from the other districts. They had the same course of instruction. It was, I think it, uh, it added to morale. We went to uh, uh, Prince George in 1956. And uh, this was at the time when uh, there was tremendous uh, transitions in forestry in the interior of the province. Uh, the prior, at the time I came, there was, uh, there was little portable mills all over. Well, those have all disappeared now. I guess what uh, started it was the expansion of uh, the pulp industry to the interior of the province. And as to eventually in the next uh, few years after I was there, two pulp mills were established in Prince George, two in the Nelson Forest District and one in the Kamloops, and there hadn't been any in the interior before this, and this changed the whole concept of forestry, and uh, this small wood, that the, uh, the interior wood had always been considered small wood, unus uh, not usable, and uh, it now became valuable for pulp, and later, as, as milling techniques improved, it became very valuable for lumber, particularly the, uh, uh, the white spruce and the lodgepole pine. We lived in 24 houses in 33 years, and he never lived in uh, one for five years. Not quite five years, no. We've had some close calls. Um, we've had cougars take dogs off the porch, and, and bears come right down to, and have had to run up, you know, from me to that table away and rescue the kids and different things like that. And uh, another time we uh, couldn't get home on the, he had to bring a boat home from Vancouver, and I ended up having to come home by myself with the two small children. And when I got into uh, Campbell River, there was a big storm the next day, and the boat couldn't come down to pick me up. 
And so the Anglican mission boat was in town, and I knew this Anglican minister because he used to come into the Thurston Bay Ranger Station once in a while. And he had a big boat. He says, well, I can get you up to a certain area if the other fellow can come down to meet you. Because it, it turned out that the forestry fellows at Camel River had come down to tell me that they weren't going to be able to take me home by the boat. And I didn't know what I was going to do because, you know, we didn't have too much money in those days. So anyways, he arranged to take me, and it was really very rough. And um, when we finally met this fellow at this more or less calmer area, this bit of an inlet, um, it was on the old Oliver Clark he was on, and uh, I said, well, how in the world are we ever going to get over to that boat that was so rough? And he said, you're just going to have to throw those kids to me, Hazel. I said, I can't throw them. You'll never catch them. He says, I'll catch them. So this um, minister came up and he says, well, you hold the boat. He says, you steer the boat. And he says, I'll toss these children. Well, of course, my heart was in my mouth. And the one baby was 10 months old and the other was about two and a half. And he tossed them over and this guy caught them. And, and then, of course, I had to jump over too. And we had about another three-hour drive. And in this boat, this little, I think it was about 30 feet, the Oliver Clark, it was an old, old forestry boat. And, and uh, we got back. But, you know, I was pretty near sick from that. And, The party chief would send us uh, two men, a cruiser and a compassman, um, on two or three week, uh, what we call fly camps, away from the base camp. And uh, they would drive you to the end of the road and, and uh, make the precise time when they would meet you at the end of what road or, or at the end of what, or beside Watt Lake if, in case a plane was going to pick you up and so forth. And uh, usually there's in some agreement that we will be there for three days from that date on and if, if, we, if you're not there then, when we, then we have to start search procedures. <laughs> but uh, from your fly camp base you might have to walk five miles um, before you started your day's work. And then you would run up to two miles of measured distance in the bush. And uh, then, then after that, you'd have to navigate your way back to your, for, to your fly camp base and prepare your supper. And by that time, you're, it was quite time for bed. <laughs> all the fires were always um, open outdoor fires. And uh, the we lived in fear of ever starting a forest fire because if we had ever started a forest fire our name would be mud for the rest of our history then <laughs> because the ranger knew we were there in that area and it, and if a survey crew ever started a fire that was the end <laughs> the forest surveyor was um, a wide wooden ship that year we had a skipper who was a, a royal navy um, sea captain and most deep sea naval uh, people don't, don't want to have anything to do with a coast anywhere. <laughs> They're always nervous. They want to know when, about what time they'd be running aground, etc. Et he was always studying, he was extremely careful. And uh, in the beginning, he didn't want to, he almost insisted on going all the way back to Prince Rupert to tie up, to take on fresh water supplies. And <laughs> when our boss came and visited, he said, You don't. That you don't, you can't spend money all, all traveling all the way back there just to get fresh water. You back it up to this waterfall and run your hoses into the tanks. And so he was just petrified, and he insisted on, first of all, taking the boat, the the small rowboats, and making um, a survey of the seabed. Uh, you know, sounding all the way with a hand line right up to the edge of the cliff. So he found it was deep enough. So they finally back the forest surveyor right up to the rocks and dumped the water right in the tanks and <laughs> away he went. But uh, our boss was like that all the time. He knew he was a very practical man. My name is Don Adams. I started with the uh, British Columbia Forest Service in uh, 1953. 
But my job was to put somebody on the boat that knew how to run it, mainly for taking crew out in the morning. Like, usually they, they worked out of a, what they called a fly camp. And uh, you loaded the crew on the boat and took them out maybe five or six miles up the river, sometimes three miles, sometimes you just crossed the river with them. And then you uh, went back and picked them up. The rivers change from year to year. And uh, although the, uh, the course stays the same, the uh, river channels change. And some of the ones up the coast, uh, we just uh, scrutinized them from air photographs, and sometimes we flew over them in a light plane or a helicopter and uh, figured out whether they were feasible to run or not, and then we tried them out. Sometimes you had to clear a log jam out or uh, sweepers across the river. And this one really wrecked my um, reputation as a boatman. It was on the Canoe River. We were going out one morning with an outboard, not a jet, and uh, we started up a riffle. And about halfway up the riffle, for some unknown reason, the outboard just slowed down and stopped. Just stopped dead. And before we could do anything, we drifted in under a sweeper. What they call a sweeper is a tree that's fallen out in the water with it makes a sort of a weir. And the boat went sideways into that and flipped over and we were all in the water. And uh, the helicopter flew over about this time and reported all over the country that there was a boat drifting down the river upside down with a bunch of bodies floating. <laughs> So we finally got into shallow water and pulled it ashore, you see, but by this time the word had gone out all over the place, you know, and they, they had us drowned and they had us dead. They apparently were fishing us out of the river and everything else, and all we did was walk ashore. In 1960, I went uh, up the coast for one summer uh, in which we tried out uh, a new version of uh, jet boats uh, using a jet propulsion instead of a propeller, which proved uh, quite successful for our operation. Uh, my experience in firefighting is primarily interior, and uh, it was pick and shovel. Then later, we used tractors. We did use planes as early as the 20s, but that was mostly for reconnaissance and transportation of crews. In the 40s, they used them for crew transportation, and they did quite a bit of parachuting and supplies. Supply, uh, supplying a remote fire, fire crew is pretty ticklish business. You can do it with parachutes quite well. About 1962, we started using water bombers, and they are one of the main ways we do it now. Tremendous amount of change in the way we do business, uh, in the way we manage the resource, and the way we, uh, in our people, the training levels of our people, the skills level of our people, it's all changed dramatically since 1960. In, six, in 1960, we used to have uh, rangers uh, located throughout the province. We had over a hundred of them with small groups of people in most of the small communities in the province. In those days, we were responsible for selling timber to the industry, ensuring that it was measured and the revenue was collected, and putting out the fires that occurred. Now, of course, we're into the management of the resource, the integration of other aspects of forest management into, the, into, into forest management. That, uh, we don't only manage the timber in the forest, we manage all the other resources, wildlife habitat, recreation resource. We'll, we're now got a mandate for wilderness management. Uh, it's much more complex, much more skill levels are required, but, we, but in the 60s we, we had some very resourceful people who did an excellent job giving the resources and the level of management that we were at in those days. I think forests will continue to play a very valuable role in our economy. We have a tremendous resource. It's, uh, it's renewable if managed correctly. It's biodegradable. It's easily converted to paper or wood products. And there's lots of things, lots of opportunities to do with our resource. I think it's, it will look upon this in the future as one of a, one tremendous asset. I wish I could be around in a hundred years to see, to see all the changes that will take place. But there will be many changes and I'm sure all of them will relate to a more sophisticated level of management, a higher realization of the importance of our forest, highly prized assets. And we in British Columbia will, are very well blessed with a tremendous forest resource.